Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Ron Mackenzie Lafergie. If you enjoyed this video, please thumbs up and subscribe to the channel down below. Godzilla has been a cultural phenomenon in Japan since the first film in 1954. Since then, the beast has taken the world by storm, terrifying audiences across the globe. But what if he wasn't just on the big screen, but actually attacked in real life? Let's explore. Get ready, it's time to ask the question, what if Godzilla was real? There have been a number of Godzilla films since the original in 1954, and each version of the monster has its own quirks. For the sake of clarity, this video will focus on Shin Godzilla, the 2016 film, as it is one of the most realistic depictions of the attack. Godzilla is a giant aquatic creature, often attacking Japan. It is believed to have been created due to radioactive contamination, which gave it the ability to constantly adapt to its surroundings. It leaves a trail of residual radiation in its wake and is able to shoot atomic blasts from its mouth and tail. Godzilla is one tough cookie, so how could we deal with it? The first step would have to be to evacuate all civilians from the area. Depending on the population density in the area of the attack, this could take some time, but it would be of the utmost importance. Between Godzilla's attacks, atomic breath, and residual radiation left after it, not to mention the attempts to stop the beast, those in the area would be in a great deal of danger. Once the area was evacuated, efforts to deal with the beast could begin in earnest. Unfortunately, it seems that most weapons don't work against Godzilla. As we saw in the 2016 film, even powerful missiles were unable to pierce its thick hide. This would lead one to look to nuclear weapons, but this raises is another concern. How would you stop this huge and tanky beast while minimizing collateral damage? One possible option is capturing Godzilla. This would be very useful since it would allow us to study the beast and learn from it, and would likely be less damaging to the city and its people. Unfortunately, this would be difficult to achieve, particularly with its atomic breath able to blast it out of most containment areas. Furthermore, if it had the same adaptive abilities as it did in Shin Godzilla, the longer it was alive, the more dangerous it would become. This likely rules out the option of capturing it alive, since there's a chance that it would simply adapt to whatever was holding it captured. This means that killing it would likely be the only option. Sadly, that's easier said than done. Shin Godzilla offered two potential solutions to the Godzilla problem. The first and less desirable option is the aforementioned use of thermonuclear weapons. This would potentially be enough to take the creature out, but would result in a huge amount of collateral damage. Not only that, but attacking a radioactive creature with nuclear weapons could result in unexpected consequences. The likely superior plan, which ended up being very effective in the film is the use of blood coagulant to freeze the monster from the inside. This was done by baiting it into using its atomic breath, then quickly injecting it with coagulant while it was recharging. This would be a difficult plan and would require a great deal of coordination, but it could be very effective, especially if Godzilla was killed for good, thus preventing further adaptation. The only problem is, this coordination could be difficult to achieve. One aspect of defending against Godzilla that is often overlooked is the bureaucratic side of things. While one might assume that a giant monster attacking a city would be enough to bring people together, that isn't necessarily the case. As we've seen in various relief efforts in recent years, sometimes the resources are there to help, but the hands of the government are tied due to policy restrictions. As it happens, Shin Godzilla did an excellent job of highlighting just how much of a problem governmental bureaucracy would be in dealing with Godzilla. With so many different branches of the government being in charge of different things, it is very difficult to coordinate all these efforts successfully and quickly. This means that even if we had the proper weaponry to deal with Godzilla, it could be difficult to organize and coordinate coordinate the effort in time to save the city. This would be particularly problematic when attempting to coordinate the actions of several governments. And now we return to our question, what if Godzilla was real? Well, humanity would be in for the fight of our lives. Civilian safety would be a primary concern with efforts to evacuate citizens from the area of the attack. Capture may not be an option if it had the adaptive capabilities we saw in Shin Godzilla, which leaves us with killing the beast. While nuclear weapons would likely be effective, the collateral damage caused could be too much to bear. For this reason, a method similar to the one in the film would likely be employed. Fool it into expending its nuclear energy, then freeze or incapacitate it while it is dormant. Unfortunately, this might be easier said than done, since government bureaucracy could delay the response until it was too late. King Kong. Not such a far-fetched idea when you really think about it. A massive prehistoric gorilla living on an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean with other prehistoric dinosaurs roaming around. What's there not to love? If you've seen any of the King Kong films or any film featuring Kong, then you likely know his appearance and size tend to vary, but for the most part, he's just a very large, incredibly strong gorilla. Or so it seems. Maybe it's what the prehistoric Gigantopithecus looked like. Maybe these King Kong looking apes were in fact real and we're just fortunate enough to live in a time where they've gone extinct. 
Either way, we gotta talk about one of my favorites and an absolute classic today. On Life's Biggest Questions, we are asking, what if King Kong was real? Make sure to smash that like button and let's get right into this one. Now, it seems there are only a couple of ways that King Kong turns from fiction into reality. Of course, there's the possibility that this prehistoric Gigantopithecus, an ape-like beast, believed to have been about nine feet tall and about 1,200 pounds, is the real King Kong. Consider how they roamed Earth up until about 300,000 years ago, it is quite possible the tale of the Gigantopithecus led to what we know now as King Kong. What I'm saying is that over the last, say, I don't know, 300,000 years or so, the tale of the Gigantopithecus was, and its size has likely varied. Meaning it's quite possible when the idea of King Kong was first conceived, it was inspired by the idea of these prehistoric apes who were said to be incredibly strong and large in size. In essence, what I'm getting at is maybe the world had a bunch of mini King Kongs roaming around, and that's just the way it was. They weren't 100 feet tall as Kong himself is believed to be, but still standing at nine feet, weighing 1,200 pounds, and with the ability to lift things up to 10 times their weight, well, these things aren't too far off what King Kong is. So it's quite possible King Kong was real and we just aren't alive to know it. Now, of course, there's also another angle to go with here. The more fun, speculative, SPC type, where King Kong is simply a lab experiment gone wrong. As we know, animals have been used for experiments in the past, and unfortunately, will likely continue to be used against their will. It was a big thing in the beauty community, and as we know, the scientific community loves to use mice. Now, that's not to say Kong was birthed from a bad batch of lipstick that some beauty company was trying on, but it is quite possible that Kong was simply the result of a lab experiment gone wrong. Maybe, I don't know, say some sort of plague or pandemic takes over, and scientists scramble to get a vaccine made as soon as possible to save humanity. They test it on an ape first, given how close they are to humans, and then bam. Now this ape has been genetically transformed to become one of the biggest, scariest animals or monsters ever known to the human race. And we refer to him as King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. Maybe the lab kept him a secret, and as his size started growing so significantly, they got help from the government to drop it on a remote island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, thinking it'll eventually die there. But it didn't, and a filmmaker or explorer ends up finding it, bringing it to New York City, it climbs the Empire State Building and grabs a girl, breaks a few planes, and that's the end of that. All right, that was a mix of like the vaccine with the movie, obviously getting fictional, joking around. Now on a more serious note here, guys, I think the reality is if King Kong was real, we all know how bad that would be. Of course, if he was stuck on Skull Island with no way of really leaving, then we wouldn't have much to worry about. Of course, the scientific community would want to do some research into this beast-like creature. You know, where did it come from? Are there more? What is it? If it was an experiment gone wrong, then Kong would likely just be stuck on the island, potentially monitored by the people who know it exists, and that's really the end of that. We'd be none the wiser, and life would continue on. However, if somehow, some way, the beast was able to cross the Indian Ocean, either by the hands of an overzealous adventurer or even the government, well, that's a very different story. At the end of the day, the reality is that enough damage to anything would likely be able to take it down. However, even if we were to shoot bazookas, use tanks and grenades to try to defeat the beast that is King Kong, surely he would inflict damage as well. Contrary to the movie, if Kong was real and was in New York City, it likely wouldn't necessarily run around wreaking havoc in the same manner. If anything, he'd probably just be very scared to be in a foreign environment. And I can tell you right now, he wouldn't climb the Empire State Building as it would simply just crumble at Kong's first grip. Still, that doesn't mean that this thing wouldn't cause mass destruction, simply trying to flee its captors. It'd be very interesting to see if PETA would also get involved as well, potentially trying to free Kong and risking their lives along the way. Safe to say, there are only two realistic ways King Kong being real can play out. Either he's on an island and just lives there until he ultimately dies, or following the storyline of the movie, a team decides to hold him captive and show him off almost as a circus act, if you will. They bring him over to New York City, which I don't see how that in itself would be possible, as there wouldn't be any way to contain this thing in the first place. But this entire video is fictional. We're talking about what would happen if a 100-foot ape was real. And then we all know the answer. It would pretty much destroy the world until a giant lizard slash dinosaur looking thing comes and the two of them have an absolutely epic battle. I am referencing Godzilla vs. King Kong. You bet your bottom dollar I'm doing that. When two worlds collide, am I right? You likely have heard of the upcoming Godzilla vs. King Kong film that has started trending as of late, and like many others, I'm excited to relive my childhood. I remember watching both films as a kid and also playing a game, I think I think it was on Xbox, where you played as Godzilla and fought other monsters such as Mothra and the Mecha Godzilla. It's just so much fun. So when the news broke of this monster match between two of the biggest and scariest going head to head in 2021, with all the new CGI and effects they have now, of course it's gonna be a fun time. And of course there was the original film titled The Same released in 1962, but this one isn't a remake as much as it is the same idea within the new monster universe they've created. Today on LBQ, we're asking what if King Kong fought Godzilla? Smash that like button and I will say answers may vary from what the movie shows, who knows. All right, so in one corner we got King Kong. He's a massive ape, we're talking about 100 feet plus, at least according to the most recent film, Kong Skull Island. He's big, he's strong, and he's ruthless. It takes a lot to get this beast down. But there is one monster who may be up to the task. 
In the other corner, we got Godzilla, standing anywhere from a couple hundred feet to almost a thousand feet tall, depending on which film or media we refer to. This monster has the ability to live on land or underwater. Aside from this, Godzilla has a fire breath of sorts, which is really an atomic breath and much more destructive than fire. He's also incredibly durable, and although not indestructible, some may seem to think so. And given that we're going with the most recent Kong film to size up the big old ape, let's keep it the same monster universe, which means Godzilla, according to the recent film Godzilla King of the Monsters, stands at 393 feet tall. It was the film prior Godzilla Planet of the Monsters that saw him at 984 feet, for some reason. <laughs> However, this is not a part of the previously mentioned monster universe. So these two face off, and the real easy answer is that Godzilla absolutely beats the <laughs> out of King Kong. Kills him. Dead. Easy. No problems at all. He's triple Kong size. I'm not sure what damage Kong can really do to Godzilla. However, for some reason in the trailer, they appear to be relatively evenly sized, in regards to height at least. So we'll go along with this narrative that both these monsters are the same size and decide to fight, so they're the last two warriors left from an ancient war. Of course, they're both fighting for different teams, which means ultimately only one can remain, crowning the victor of the battle and war. So these two go head to head. Who wins? Well, that all depends on where this happens. Of course, as per the movie's trailer, it shows the two of them fighting both on land and water. I think the realistic and safe bet is to say that if these two fought in the water, Godzilla would likely win fairly easily. Given his speed advantage, as well as being able to breathe underwater, something obviously Kong can't do, it seems Godzilla would have too many advantages to easily give him a win in this battle. However, if the two fought on land, well that's a different story. Not to say by any means that it's a walk in the park for Kong, because it certainly would not be. In fact, I can't even say for sure who would win the battle of these two on land, as it depends on a lot of variables. Who gets hit first? Who has the better abilities? Although again, it seems Godzilla wins there. But Kong is incredibly strong, and like an ape, not easy to take down at all. Specifically referencing the atomic breath, it seems in the previous Godzilla vs King Kong film from 1962, Kong was somewhat resistant, although it was noted a direct blast could kill him. Much like Godzilla, Kong is incredibly durable and smart, quickly figuring out his opponent's weakness and attacking. As previously mentioned, numerous factors and variables go into deciding who wins this one, and although I've always liked Kong over Godzilla, it seems Godzilla would inevitably win this one, simply due to the fact that he is less likely to worry about his surrounding environment. As we've seen with Kong in the films, he's not so aggressive, and is actually somewhat gentle to those who aren't trying to bring him harm. With this in mind, it's more likely than not that Kong finds himself somewhat compromised, trying not to injure any innocent civilians around him. Maybe he doesn't think twice about the people and just focuses on the giant monster trying to kill him. I really can't say for sure, guys. What I can say for sure is that if these two were to go at it, wherever that battle would take place, well, it would be completely destroyed. It would seem almost as if an entire war had broken out. Assuming that every time these two strike each other and one falls, craters form in the streets. Uh, obviously surrounding buildings and properties would be completely wrecked and potentially used as a form of weapon. The monsters could either use the buildings as a blunt object or throw their opponent into them. Surely this would cause earthquakes of insane magnitude to affect the surrounding areas of wherever this fight were to take place. And if there were large bodies of water nearby, that likely means tsunamis would form as well. Bundle all the unnaturally caused natural disasters along with these two hundred foot monsters beating each other up and you got yourselves a completely destroyed city. Likely country, because they're pretty big. I'm sure they would go like across the whole country. Really depends where the fight happens. All in all guys, it's no good. That's safe to say. Jormungandr. What a name. In Norse mythology, it's believed this name means huge monster. Other sources claim it translates to Earth's necklace. Both would be valid when describing this humongous serpent, which is said to be so long, it could literally wrap around the earth and still not be fully extended. Yes, this thing is quite large. Some claim it is a snake, while others say it is a dragon. However, it seems the most common myth paints this guy as a snake, so we'll roll with that. And it's possibly the biggest beast in Norse mythology, so this is going to be a fun one. What's going down guys? Welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm your host, Jared Bronstein, and today we'll be exploring the idea, what if Jormungandr was real? As always, make sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified of our videos, and drop us some comments below with other questions you may have. I'll be replying to some comments to wrap this video up, but for now we need to get talking about Norse mythology, more specifically, this terrifying beast known as Jormungandr. So as previously mentioned, some say it's a dragon, some say it's a snake, but one thing is certain, it's a serpent of some kind. The child of Loki, the god of chaos, and his mistress, the giant, and Groboda, it seems Jormungandr has taken its parents best qualities, making it a large, vicious being who simply enjoys chaos. Aside from its body being long enough to wrap around earth, Jormungandr also has an incredibly large mouth filled with venom dripping teeth, and this thing is known to have the ability to swallow giants and gods whole. 
so clearly us humans wouldn't really have much of a chance if we had to fight this thing. Now thankfully, if Jormungandr was real, that wouldn't be the case. You see, Jormungandr was known to have quite the rivalry with a god by the name of Thor. You might know of him, there's been a few movies made with him being the protagonist of the film. And as terrifying as it would be knowing that there is a large snake who's said to live below the ocean, the size of Earth just waiting the day it can wake up and destroy Earth and all of humanity, we also need to consider this. If Jormungandr is real, that means the other Norse gods are real. And I'm not going to make this entire video explaining what life would be like if Norse gods were real, because we actually did a video on that not too long ago. So go check that out for a more in-depth understanding of Norse gods. But in a short summary, what I'm saying here is, if one exists, then so does the other. Meaning, if Jormungandr was sleeping in the bottom of the ocean, and somehow someway was bothered, inevitably waking it up from this slumber, Earth wouldn't necessarily be doomed. Of course, the second this thing comes up from the water, tsunamis would most likely destroy a few continents. Not countries, entire continents. We need to consider that this thing rising from the ocean would make waves the size of... I don't even know what. I mean, it's bigger than Earth, so... Use your imagination. But before this thing was even able to get to the surface to even try to attack Earth, Thor would most likely step in and battle on behalf of the human race. Jormungandr and Thor have quite a history with each other, which actually ended with the two of them dying. During the Battle of Ragnarok, as per Norse mythology, Thor successfully defeated Jormungandr, only to ultimately die from being poisoned by the serpent's venom. So in a sense, if Jormungandr was real, well we wouldn't even know because Thor would have already killed it. Essentially what I'm saying is that according to Norse mythology, all of this already did happen. Which means, in fact, not only were Thor and Jormungandr real, but so were all the other gods, including Loki. And if this is the case, well then what would this mean for other religions and people who pray to other gods? Does that mean that they too are real, or is this proof in a sense that there is only one real religion or gods that everyone should be worshipping? That is something that would need to be decided by each individual person, which would depend on how strong their belief is in said religion. But if these gods are real and once upon a time a battle broke out as epic as this would have been, well I don't think it would just stop there. Even though this is set to have taken place in the 13th century, how do we know that the planet of Asgard, where all the gods met, still doesn't exist? It can't be seen by any mortal man, meaning you and I would never even know it existed in the first place. Now personally, I'm not a very religious guy, and as I said before, it all depends on your personal belief. But the same way people worship a god they can't physically see, why is it so far-fetched to believe there is a planet in the sky we can't see but exists? Which also begs the question, how do we know when, if at all, these gods will go to battle again? But going with this angle, under the impression that we can't see Asgard in the sky, but it exists, how would we be able to see any of the other gods, or in this case, Th Thor or Jormungandr? Essentially what I'm saying is, if any of Norse mythology was real, we wouldn't be able to see it in the first place. So if Jormungandr was in fact real, we wouldn't even know. Not to say this battle would go down in an alternate reality, it's very possible it does happen in our universe and possibly on Earth, but we wouldn't actually see the fight. What we could see, however, is natural disasters. Heavy thunderstorms caused by Thor, tsunamis caused by Jormungandr coming up from the depths of the ocean. To us, these would just be a regular occurrence and Mother Nature doing its thing. But in reality, it'd be a battle between a couple epic, larger-than-life gods. There are plenty of terrifying beings in the Magic the Gathering universe, but maybe none so awful and mind-rending as the Eldrazi. These multi-dimensional Lovecraftian beings exist to corrupt and destroy, and ever since they were locked away on Zendikar by the Three, nobody has been able to beat them in a decisive manner. Okay, sure, in the battle for Zendikar, two Eldrazi were defeated in physical form, but we'll get there in a second. In the Meanwhile, let your fear compound and your hopes drain away. Hello fellow friends and philosophers, and welcome to the most mind-bending channel on YouTube, Life's Biggest Questions. I'm your voice in the void, Keegan Hughes, and today we're taking a look at a question that would get you turned into chalky white lattice work. What if Ulamog was real? Before we don our bone mask, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more magic madness. Let's get started. If you haven't seen our video on Emrakul, then you might not know what the Eldrazi are. You can go check that out now if you want a more in-depth version. In 20 words or less, they are ancient beings native to the blind eternities, a place outside of physical space. They exist to consume, corrupt, and destroy. Okay, I think that was exactly 20 words. So, the Eldrazi, being cosmic horrors, basically drain worlds of all their mana and energy and then move on to the next. 
The three Eldrazi Titans are the most powerful and have control over the rest of the Eldrazi brood. There is Emrakul, the Aeon's Torn, the Titan of Corruption. Then there's Kozilek, the Butcher of Truth, the Titan of Distortion. And finally, the subject of today's video, Ulamog, Infinite Gyre, the Titan of Consumption. Of the three Titans, Ulamog is the smallest. This does not mean that it's the least dangerous or the weakest though. And even if it did, the weakest Eldrazi Titan has enough power to tear entire worlds apart. Ulamog and all of its brood have heads that resemble bony helmets, but lack eyes or expressions. It is still unknown how Ulamog navigates, as there do not appear to be any sort of sensory organs anywhere on its form. Most of its body consists of exposed muscle and is covered with bony plates. Moving around on a writhing mass of tentacles, Ulamog is also studded with bony spikes below the torso. These appendages twist and undulate beneath its form, carrying it wherever it needs to go. To add even more limbs to the equation, Ulamog also has two arms that split into four more at the elbow. The stench of rotten meat, decay, and sulfur surrounds it constantly, leading to another name being attributed to this Eldrazi, the Reeking Titan. Fitting, don't you think? As the Titan of Consumption, Ulamog and its brood consume living and unliving matter alike. Its processors transform the consumed energy into spell-like effects that defy all understanding. Plagues are created, deadly parasites are brought forth, and endlessly teeming spawn cover the earth. These beings drain all of the energy from everything they come in contact with, leaving behind distinctive white, chalky, lattice-like structures in their wake. This lattice structure is typical of Eldrazi destruction. Everything, even water, is transformed into a white, manalist husk of what it once was. Even water. Imagine that, a husk of water. Before Ulamog, I just thought that a husk meant something that was totally waterless, but now it goes even deeper. My brain can't keep up. Ulamog is emblematic of plague, the blind bonds between parasite and host, and overabundance. It is creation and destruction wrapped together in unholy matrimony. One might be even so bold as to compare Ulamog's ceaseless hunger and subsequent creation of consumers to those same traits in humanity. Don't think too hard or you might want to leave the planet. So what if Ulamog was real? What if the ceaseless hunger popped in for a visit on our dear sweet planet Earth? Well. We'd be screwed, that's what would happen. Each of the Eldrazi Titans can spawn its own lineage, armies of children to perform various tasks on the way to the total annihilation of a world. These little gaffers are weaker than the actual Titans, but share many characteristics with their progenitors. Ulamog's brood tends to be dense masses of fleshy tentacles, just like their daddy. They have limbs that split at the elbow, as well as the iconic eyeless, bony plates for faces. No skin, exposing their muscle and bone as well. These Eldrazitas exist just to consume the land as quickly and efficiently as possible, with no semblance of subtlety. There are plenty of different varieties of these broodlings as well, ranging from food for the bigger boys, to fighters, to things meant to cull all living beings who may oppose the unstoppable spread of pestilence. There are even variations known as the Fathom Feeders, who are specialized in infiltrating the deep seas. Once they get going, there is no avoiding them. All of these spawn gives Zendikar a little to no chance of survival. So what makes you think that Earth would be any hardier? We don't even have planeswalkers to call upon when times get tough, at least none that I know of. So when Ulamog manifests itself on Earth, we are in for a bad time. Ulamog itself would undulate through densely populated areas, sending its tiny minions to cull, kill, eviscerate, and drain the life force of anything that moves or doesn't move. Even as humans begin to adapt, as they so often do, things like disease and plague would spread as well. Parasites like the Dominator Drone would attach themselves to living hosts, and use those hosts to wreak havoc among the unafflicted. Mana and vital energy would be drained, and white shells would be left behind devoid of anything that might constitute energy. Overconsumption would take on a whole new meaning as humans watch everything around them crumble. The overwhelming stink of it all wouldn't help either. It would be difficult to fight back against the ceaseless hunger, as the very resources required to fight back would be consumed right before our very eyes. Water, food, fuel, minerals, all drained of their attributes that make them useful. We would be left with a barren wasteland where nothing could possibly live or grow. Even our greatest weapons, like nuclear warheads, would be rendered useless as Ulamog and its brood would just sap the vast energy from those two. It would be a difficult fight to win, for sure. The fight for Zendikar and the magic cannon involved the apparent deaths of not only one, but two Eldrazi though, so why don't we look to that story for some help. Ulamog ended up being the only titan on Zendikar for a couple years after Emrakul and Kozilek vanished. After inadvertently creating a race of vampires, Ulamog rose up to blight and ravage the planet. Eventually some planeswalkers decided to step in and come with a plan, and it almost worked. 
Unfortunately, Ob Nixilis interfered and allowed Kozilek to jump back into the fray before Gideon Jura could lay a finishing blow on Ulamog. Then everyone had to fight two Eldrazi, and somehow they came up with a last ditch plan to take him down, and it worked. No important casualties, just red shirts. Isn't it nice when things just work out? They didn't even need to use colorless magic to do it. So yeah, if Ulamog was real, all we would ever really need to do is let Deus Ex Machina take over and we'd be good to go. God from the machine, baby. Who needs a well thought out conclusion when we can just wish it away? Although the consequences for taking down an Eldrazi in physical form may be yet unrealized. Who knows if they still have parts of themselves in other dimensions or back in the blind eternities. Can an Eldrazi really die? Maybe someday we'll find out. But for now, we can all definitely agree that if Ulamog was indeed real, it would be a very very bad thing. We would have our life forces drained before breakfast, unfortunately. Dang.